I feel like every time I have been honest, my life has gotten better. Sometimes you feel the little, what we, what Brené Brown calls the vulnerability hangover. So yeah. like immediately after you're like, oh, what have I done? Right. And then afterwards you're like, that person leans in and you're like, oh, I'm not alone. I am not the only one experiencing this. So certainly talk, but do assess a little bit. Sometimes it's small steps to making it that way. Welcome to the HR LND podcast, where we explore cutting edge HR trends and best practices with top leaders who are shaping the future of work. My name is Nick Day and I'm founder of JGA Recruitment Group, a specialist HR search firm. I'm also a qualified executive coach and a recognized HR thought leader listed on Thinkers360. Together, we're going to dive into topics from diversity and inclusion to technology, learning curation and employee experience to help you evolve your people and your development strategies. So whether you're a flourishing HR executive, a rising manager or a seasoned CHRO who's driving transformation, this podcast is for you. So grab your coffee and let's play. Hello and welcome back to the HR L&D podcast. My name is Nick Day, CEO of JGA Recruitment, and we are specialist HR recruiters. Now, I'm not going to go into a big spiel today about reviewing our site or sharing with your colleagues because I've got a fantastic guest to welcome to the show. And today's introduction is a little bit longer than usual, but then this is a guest like no other. Today, I'm joined by Petra Velzeboer, who is a qualified psychotherapist, global keynote speaker, TEDx speaker, and CEO of PVL. Now, the reason this introduction is a little bit longer, and you're going to find out why, is there is a special story that we're going to uncover today that really links to the world of mental health and wellness. And today's episode is all about mental health strategy in the workplace. We know it's really high up on HR agendas at the moment, and rightly, it should be as well. You see, Petra's expertise and passion stems from her own personal experience battling mental health and struggling with cultural and circumstantial challenges. After being raised in a religious cult without any access to formal education, her story and climb from rock bottom has inspired thousands to better understand how to improve mental health, both for themselves and for others. Now, she's earned her MSc in psychodynamics in human development in 2012. She's gone on to become a certified coach and she's battled mental illness, including addiction and depression in fact, she's even contemplated taking her own life. I don't want to give the whole story away. I'm going to ask Petra to bring it to life for you. But what I will say is it was at that junction that she challenged herself to a year of intentional living. And it's led her to a fantastic journey to help other organizations to create supportive, preemptive and sustainable cultures that improve mental health for everyone in a proactive rather than a reactive process. Managing her own wellness has become her greatest asset in supporting her clients. I cannot wait to get involved in this conversation today. I think it's absolutely relevant to this new world of work. And I have to say as well, and you can get this in the show notes, through her consultancy PBL, and there's a link directly through, so please do check that out at the end of the show. Petra and her team are now working to fulfill a vision where every organization could be the rising tide that lifts and sustains mental health, not just for every employee, but also for their families and their community. So without further ado, Petra Velzebara, welcome to the HR L&D podcast. I cannot wait to welcome you to the show and to ask you everything about HR strategy. How are you feeling today? I'm excited. Thank you for having me, Nick. And um, what, uh, what, I mean, what a great intro. You certainly went in depth and made me sound amazing. You um, are amazing. You're doing some <laughs> fantastic work in, a, I, I guess it's, a, it's an area, a field that I'm particularly passionate about myself. It's absolutely imperative that we understand uh, the impact the mental health can have on the workplace and on those around us. So before we get into the the nitty gritty and the deep dive, let me just ask the question I ask all of my guests, which is this, what do the words human resources mean to you? Um, so, so many things. I mean, I once heard somebody say that HR stood for human remains, which was <laughs> a nod to kind of the old school methodology that that many people were practicing. But of course, pandemic times and the new world of work and how fast things have escalated have meant that not only are there different titles popping up, like people, teams, and and directors, and all the rest of it, but really it's become such an essential, integral part of a business. So it's resourcing humans. I would just put it backwards is what the definition is. And that starts with you as an HR professional and then ripples out to the people around you. 
Lovely. And actually, that's quite powerful. You mentioned the you in that. And I'm a huge advocate in the power of personal stories when it comes to well-being and mental health. Uh, we all have a story to tell. And Absolutely. you, your story in particular is one that that really does um, strike strike a number of chords, which it certainly did for me when I found out more about your journey. Um, I wondered if you could just lay some of the foundations. I've done a little bit of the introduction there, but just sure. inform our listeners a little bit more about your own backstory, because it it's really what's led you to where you are today, which is being with me on this on this HRLND podcast in particular. But more importantly, it's led you to the wonderful work you're doing to to help create more positive cultures for workplaces across the globe. So I wonder if you could just uh, bring that to life sure. a little bit for our listeners. Yeah, and um, you never know where life will take you, right? There is no way growing up in communes uh, globally. I lived in India, Brazil, Kenya, Russia, also all over Europe. Uh, with, you know, five siblings and loads of other people, lots of music, lots of learning, a mission, you know, I had no idea that those key experiences would give me, a, you know, an angle or, or key insights into the world of work. Because if we think of um, the word cult, it's bang on in the word culture, isn't it? And there's healthy yeah. ways of doing it. And there's less healthy ways. So I guess there were good bits. This is what people sometimes assume. They assume that, you know, everything was torture growing up, right? But people are drawn to these communities because there's connection, there's a feeling of shared mission, right? So people are looking for that more than more than ever before. But over time, it became more coercive control. We didn't go to school as kids. If, if teenagers, like as we got a little bit older, decided that wasn't the life for us, the families would, would effectively shun them or disown them. And so you'd now be out in the world with no education, uh, with no kind of blueprint for how to build a life outside. And of course, so many of my generation ended up struggling with mental health issues, suicides, you know, just a whole range of things simply because we didn't know how to ask for help. And we learned early on that you wear a mask. On the inside was one thing, and on the outside was our PR version of our lives, right? Helping others. And I see so many threads to the tick box exercise of well being, which essentially is. This is the PR version. Hey, we've got all these benefits, right? Um, and and but how how deep does that go? And is there so many other things that I'm sure sure we'll get into later? So as a teenager, I began, and a young adult, I started leading a real double life. So on the one hand, I was actually trusted within the community. So I was helping with youth programs and camps and like leadership and just different pieces, which kind of earned me some trust and you know credibility, you know, which allowed me a little bit more freedom. And on the other hand, one of my sisters had had left already and I started leading just a hedonistic life of escapism, alcohol, drugs, just like, who am I? What was the truth? Like, you know how sometimes you feel in your body that something's not right and you don't agree yeah. with things, but it's so much harder to actually cognitively make some brave decisions. So as you said, I, I spiraled myself and um, ended up leaving at, at 22. Uh, this is the short version, trust me. I uh, ended up leaving at 22 pregnant. I'd been dating somebody outside of the the, the culture, which wasn't allowed. Uh, and it, respect to him, he's now my ex-husband, but he said, move to London, move in with me, let's figure this out, right? And so, but but people think that once you've escaped, that's usually the question I get in keynotes is how did you escape, right? And they, they think it's like a, a date, it, it's a minute thing. Like, you know, one day I was in, the next day I was out, cool, life is good. But actually, the real trouble begins then when you don't belong, when you have no rules for life. And I spiraled much further while I had a young child into addiction, as you said, depression, poor mental health. But I had to wake up one day and realize that I could either be a victim of my surroundings, my environment and my past. Hey, I didn't go to school. I didn't have, you know, all these things, um, which was leading to my depression and addiction. It's, it, it's literally avoiding taking control of your life sometimes, you know, uh, and I had to go, well, let me experiment with all of those well-being tools and see what works for me. And slowly, slowly, uh, life radically changed and is uh, where, where, where I'm at today. Fantastic. I mean, just to, to bring this um, to life for some other visuals, but even more so from what you just mentioned there, I'm trying to think of some of the language you've used there. You use the language or the word, the mask, and we take the mask off. And I think that's so relevant in any way of life. We have masks, we have different identities that we wear, and we want the outside world to see. And the inside world, we sometimes feel very different. Yeah. And we wear these masks to try and block out the outside world. I mean, in your instance, the cult we were talking about was the Children of God cult, which are thousands yeah. of people who were involved in. And there's yeah, yeah. a lot of uh, press about that if people want to find out more. But 
you know, you got yourself out of that. We talked about the escape, but actually in your story, you gave yourself one year to take your own life and you had to strip that mask off and, and change your life. There was a decision. There was a moment where you've gone enough is enough and people have their breaking points. And actually that story now has inspired a, a fantastic amount of great, great work. And, and, and I can't commend that enough. Um, but the power of stories, I mean, my own background, very, very different. My mum is, is my icon and she was a homeless uh, as a child and she had to break free. And, and actually, oh, wow. interestingly, when she found that security, she similarly went a little bit off the rails with things because it's hard to You're know. Finally what safe. Yeah. And to know what yeah. even know what normal is. Like, we, we, what is normal is a whole different yeah, question around that. So with everything you've gone through, you know, I think you've kind of given us the foundation there to say that we need a mental health strategy. We need to make sure people can feel comfortable removing those masks and bringing their whole selves to work if that's the best way to be using. And I would argue it's probably more essential now than ever because it's much more in people's consciousness at the moment. We can do something about it. There are tools, there are experts like yourself helping people. But where do we start? Where's the starting point for creating an HR strategy if we haven't got that backdrop, or we haven't got that experience that you've got there, Petra? Sure. Um and it, it's interesting, the stuff you say about masks, because sometimes HR and L&D teams who are tasked with looking after others, they think all of this stuff applies to those others that they're helping, right? And kind of forget that as the HR leaders, it applies to us as well, right? So, so taking that mask off, showing up as who we are actually brings people to, together in a more dynamic way. First of all, many companies are doing something, you know, yeah. they might have a, a, a mental health awareness day initiative or they might have mental health first aiders or they may have health and safety reps or whatever it might look like in your, in your industry. There, there will be something there. But what I still see, you know, broadly across the board is a crisis driven approach. So one that has an employee assistance helpline, we're essentially outsourcing the problem. And it's got under the guise of like, well, we're not professionals. We must signpost, you know, over there, they will help them. But if you've been to therapy, you know that a therapist creates a safe space to listen and yes, occasionally offers some insight or some patterns or, you know, points and things out. But in order for people to feel included in their workplace, we need to be able to have some of these conversations together. Now, I don't just mean let's all sing Kumbaya and have a cry and talk about how depressed we are or the cost of living crisis, right? Of course, that stuff is there and, and we're experiencing it. But if you think about the mental health continuum, which on one end has the crisis struggling kind of side, and in the middle is survival, and on the other side is thriving and excelling. So my question to you as HR leads and, and L&D leads when creating a strategy is, what is the environment we want to create in order to help people thrive? And then that language translates to your board as well. So how do we help people perform? That's going to be the language they're going to get, right? and get on board with, right? Sure. And so I would start with dreaming forward. What do we want to be known for? What do we? What kind of talent do we want to attract? Do a little bit of blue sky thinking about like where we wanna to get to, because so often we get stuck in, in tactics. Which app should we get? I've got this much budget. What's the action plan of things to do? But what we, we know is engagement on many tech solutions as well as even webinars and you know the, the, the panels or whatever, it's dipping, right? And why is that? Because the world of work is changing. And so we need to be able to zoom out and look ahead to how, the, you know, how that is affecting our people, truly listen and actually begin the building blocks with that, with a bit of a longer run up in mind. Does that make sense? Just as, as that no, absolutely like, makes sense. Start? I've got neuro things flying <laughs> all over the place at the minute with that response. I mean, I think um, the first thing that hit me was, uh, it was Michael Neal, who's a coach um, that, that I've, I've read some of his material and he talks about the lamppost metaphor but actually just talking to a lamppost for half an hour would do everyone some good. So just yeah. imagine a power of talking to someone who can talk back. And I think we've, you talked a lot about there about the tools and the output thing. I think that sometimes, certainly in the new world of work, we've become in, we, we sort of moved into an out, an outputs led style of management because people are working remotely. So we're not worried about the, the how we're worried about whether it's been done. And therefore we do sometimes go straight to the, to the response pit, the tools. We miss that really important stuff that you just talked about there, that the, the, the information that, that creates those outputs. But more importantly, the thing that really resonated with me is you talked about the EAP uh, mentioned right at the start there, but when it comes to mental health strategy, people tend to go really heavy, really dark, really oh. quickly. 
And yet when I look at your website and the way that you approach mental health, even despite the backdrop of your story, which, you know, could have resulted in you taking your own life, actually, when it comes to well-being, you seem to be able to do it in a really positive way with a real lightness of touch. So what's, how do we, how do we do that? How do we tackle such a heavy subject in a way that gets buy-in and gets, has resonance, but isn't so dark? So... I'm probably influenced by positive psychology, but also with the tactics that have worked for me. So being more solution focused about where I want to get to rather than let's focus on what I don't want to feel. Let's focus on what we do want to feel. So kind of gratitude practices and things like that. Um, Sean Acor, the positive psychologist, has one of the best TED Talks out there. And I believe it's called The Happiness Advantage. But he basically says, so this company is going to, I think he's referring to a school. And so he's like, we're going to do a wellness week. And they're really proud of it. And that so much organization has gone in. It's going to be really exciting. And he says, I'm, I'm going to rephrase. But on Monday, we've got school bullying and violence. On Tuesday, we've got <laughs> self-harm and depression. You get where I'm going, right? Yeah, and yeah. so every day is like, um, you know, something, they're going to focus on something negative. And he went, that's not a wellness week. That's a sickness week. And if we just think about that and apply it to our well-being strategies, are you creating wellness weeks and months and initiatives? Or are you creating sickness weeks where we all focus on what's yeah. so terrible and wrong in the world? And you can tell I can talk about this all day, but um, that, you know, I want to um, reposition the conversation again to how do we take personal responsibility for our own mental health to enable us to thrive? And I think in this world of output, output hybrid working, as, as, as you referred to it, no longer can the business be as responsible for your well-being. Yes, systems, culture has an impact, of course, but you're, you know, I got to get up from my desk. Nobody's watching me. I'm not watching if he's having his lunch break at the same time. I've got to go to my gym. I've got to eat the right food. You know, I have to recreate habits and take radical responsibility for my life where you just could follow a little bit more beforehand, right? Um, yeah, But I'll also say there's plenty of micromanagement still going on in a hybrid remote world, right? So I don't think everyone's of the mindset is that you are that like, it's about output. It's not about how. It's a, it's a bit messy, I think, in many places yeah. how they're approaching it. I think even the, you know, we're talking open now about, you know, you mentioned cult and culture earlier, but it, actually we companies are very quick to talk about the positive culture they have in their businesses. And just picking up on what you mentioned there. It's very hard, I think, for any company to say anything about their culture, because if you're a large business, there are micro cultures throughout that that may not actually be what everyone thinks it is. And it's managing, as you say, the, the micro cultures, the, the little things that happen that actually have a bigger impact. What we do know in the world of HR, though, is they've got access to huge realms of data. They're looking at data trends for things that can influence HR strategy. Absolutely. Is there data that we, you know, without making it a cold, hard approach to wellness strategy, but is there data that we can be pulling on that can really help support our wellness or our our mental health agendas? There is. And that's one of the things we do at PVL is we support companies through our well-being strategy program to effectively tell the story of their data. So um, so there's data coming from all sorts of places, right? Uh, You might have engagement surveys. We've got retention. We've got attrition. We've got uh, engagement. You know, there's a whole range of things. But so often they're still working in silos a little bit, diversity and inclusion, L&D, HR, culture and engagement, right? And not necessarily really speaking to each other. And then beyond that, now we've got all this data. What the hell do we do with it? Don't communicate effectively to your people the insights that you've taken from it. Next year, they're like, well, nothing happens with this data anyway. Like, why Mm -hmm. would I fill in the survey? Just to to give some of those anecdotal points. Um, so what we've got is not only kind of the, the strategy project management tool so you can see everything and prioritize, but with our analyst and our head of strategy, we help pull together the story of that data and then effectively translate it into a dollar pound amount of savings. So your return on investment, what is your return on investment? Because as much as I'm like me and you, you know, and many human resources people, it's like, we're, we've got the human in it, right? So we're like, mm-hmm. we just know it's right. Sometimes it's just the right thing to do. But sometimes these days, you need those numbers and data to then go to your board and make it kind of a board level initiative with your, your C-suite, your executives, and just show them that like, hey, when we invest in prevention over here, this is what it's saving you in turnover, presenteeism, the, the, the whole list of things that you can see in Deloitte reports and, and, and all of that. So data is crucial. But the most crucial thing, if I was to to just speak from the heart, is uh, developing the skill of bravery. 
and and that sounds a bit like out there. You're like, what are you talking about? Like, I do board meetings every day. I'm brave. You know, are you? Um, bravery is showing up and being yourself and asking deep questions, even when you're in a rush or you don't know that you'll know the answer. That's the biggest yeah. one, I think. Yeah, well, I don't. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, anything you say you're brave about, it's not. That's not what it's about. It's about the things that you can't make that statement to. That is where you need to show up. I'm a massive fan of, of, of uh, show the kind of things I'm into. But um, I bought a zoo is a film which I love. But in there, there's a concept where he says 20 seconds of bravery can change the world, and it's just about sometimes just to hold your breath and go for 20 seconds and then see what happens. Be brave about the things that you're most vulnerable about. Get it out when it's out there. Then, then we can see change. Then we can see reaction. And we can see how that's interpreted, and we can work through it. But if you never get it out there, if you never show that vulnerable side, then it's very, very difficult. And what we do know, and all the studies show us, is vulnerability breeds more vulnerability, where other people start to share, and that connection. shows more empathy. And it's, you know, so it comes a snowball effect. Yeah, connection and belonging. And one of the things that made me think of is, you know, when I go to a company initially and I ask about their culture and they have all the shiny things like we've got the ERG network and we've got the mental health champions and we've got, you know, list, 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 the, the resources and things that they have. And I'll ask about their ERGs or their mental health champion networks. Oh, great. How often do they meet? You know, like this is amazing, whatever. Uh, and then I'll ask. Um, so how often did they actually talk to each other about their mental health? Ooh, yeah. no. Ooh, you know, or how yeah. often do, you, do the people teams kind of talk to each other about what's really going on for them? Because the ripple effect of leading by example in those micro cultures, that's what then has the ripple effect across the business. You can have all the policies in the world and a dusty strategy over here, but unless you're going to bring it to life through action, through daily uh, working practices, the leadership, the whole, the whole piece, like, it's going to, nobody's going to know it exists, right? It's going to disappear. So where did, what something comes to mind when you say that? Because you're absolutely right. You know, that sometimes it's probably the easiest thing to forget as an HR professional, right? We're, we're always outwardly looking, trying to help those and our employees and everyone around us. We forget our own health and actually yeah. we can forget our own health because I'll deal with that tomorrow. You know, we have that mindset. I know me, I'll deal with it tomorrow. And eventually tomorrow is tomorrow is tomorrow and a year passes and so on. And we slowly go down that way. But we, in order to be able to be vulnerable in the workplace, we need to create psychological safety. And you mentioned earlier that, you know, agendas are sometimes confused because we're trying to be inclusive on one part of the agenda. We're trying to be, make sure that we are inclusive across a wide spectrum of things from neurodiversity through to equity and inclusion and, and all the things that, that kind of that wraps in. But it seems to me that in order to have a robust mental health strategy, first, we need to create psychological safety to be able to talk about this openly. But what's your experience been in or what would you recommend is probably where I'm putting it what approach would you recommend HR professionals took to first create the psychological safety that's required in order to have those more challenging conversations I would say that building psychological safety can be part of your strategy so um, of course the first step is for the people in the room so whoever's um, tasked with this this and you know as well as some allies within leadership you know you've obviously got some budget or given somebody the task to do this so it's important to an extent, right? Um, and so those people need to have honest conversations. Like I said, blue sky thinking, where do we yeah. want to get to? But then the honest conversations are like, hey, this is where we're at as a business. These are our pockets of people that just don't get it. This is the industry we're in. So it's not about running before you can walk, but it's about being straight, like honest with each other about where you are at. Because then the building blocks, even if slower, Right. And take it, you know, our first year is going to be about embedding psychological safety across different parts of the business. How do we do that? Through training, through resources, through leading by example, getting our exec teams to understand the concept, you know, whatever it might be. Sure. So there's no perfect starting point. You know, sometimes we don't have our ducks in a row and then we go, OK, now we've got everything we need to create a strategy. Sometimes the strategy is small and it's simple and it thinks about culture prevention as well as access to support. So often it's the access to support piece or we separate out the well-being from mental health. But to me, it's a, it's a continuum that is connected and impacts everybody, which should also be speaking to the DNI strategy, to yeah. the L&D team, like talk to each other people and sure. align your strategies. Because part of the engagement issue is 
I got five emails this week about different initiatives and I couldn't attend them, you know, and usually that's because you didn't align your strategies. And now it's not doing anybody a service, right? With all the best intention and work that you, you put into it. Have you ever asked yourself, how can any recruiter understand my HR recruitment challenges? Please don't give up on your hiring challenges just yet. Here at JGA HR Recruitment, we appreciate the difficulties associated with attracting, recruiting and retaining top human resources talent. We also understand just how costly a poor hire can be. JGA HR Recruitment would like to partner with you to help you overcome your hiring challenges. Contact us today on 01727 800 377 or visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I made a note right at the start of this when you talked about tick boxing. And that's, you know, we know that a lot of companies will try and follow a tick box approach. And I was going to ask uh, a question of, you know, with so many initiatives failing due to what is a tick box approach, and sometimes they'll use a reward program approach to well being as well, which I, I think is something potentially slightly different. But the approach you've taken seems to be a lot more powerful and more importantly, more sustainable. Yeah. But I also know that, you know, my research in, in terms of the work that you've been doing is your approach to HR strategy for for mental health is much more proactive than reactive it's yes. you know if you, if you take a proactive approach let's not suddenly have an agenda when something goes wrong tell me a little bit more about that approach that you've taken and some of the results you've seen from taking a proactive approach to mental health so anecdotally it's about um people staying in companies longer it's um the amount of hr people who reach out to me on linkedin and say they they are the ones leaving their companies because they are are burnt out, overwhelmed. Yeah. Somebody said something profound. She said, I was there for everyone during the pandemic. And then when I struggled, no one was there for me. And so who? where's HR for HR, right? Yeah. And so we need to often be that for each other in our own peer networks and challenge each other to, to, to create positive accountability. So in my team, you know, we go, what are you doing to invest in your mental health today? That's like a normal question that we ask each other. And someone might say, oh, I've got to get to sleep early. Or I didn't do my thing yesterday, which was go to the gym. And so I'm feeling it a bit, but I've got to soldier through to this deadline. And tomorrow I'm going to do this. And then we check in on each other. So it's not making unrealistic expectations, but it's opening up. It's normalizing the conversation about good mental health and the things that are in our control when it comes to mental health, because that's what builds trust. Now, sure. when somebody is struggling, they're more, more likely to, to talk about it. And I totally forgot your question because I got very excited about <laughs> talking no, about No, I, mean, I think you've answered it, really. We're just taking a proactive approach to, yes. uh, to creating a sustainable um, culture for, of, of mental health awareness, really, because you mentioned right at the start of the, of the conversation uh, today about a lot of companies following a tip box exercise. Absolutely. And I think, we, well, certainly it sounds like you and I can agree. I imagine most people can agree in listening to this that that hasn't really worked because we're still having a conversation about failing mental health strategies, right? And, and I, there's... Yeah, there are so many mental health experts out there now, right? And it can yeah. actually be really hard to know what's the right fit for your business. So again, with the best intention in the world, you book the professor or the doctor or the highest credible person with as many letters behind their name, but they're not necessarily uh, creating, um, translating the theory into practical tools that apply to the workplace now, right? So you need to kind of assess people against, you know, is it going to be uplifting? Is it going to be practical? And what will be the takeaways, right? When you do it that way, people want to come back for the next one. But I've seen the exact opposite happen. And of course, every time you erode trust, make people think, oh, it's a waste of time, or I felt worse at worse afterwards. But I also say, you know, if you're starting with a tick box, great. It's still a starting point. Starting point, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, great. You know, that's sometimes a starting point. That's a build. That's a place we can build from, right? So I'm like, if you want to hire us for your tick box, let, let's come in and show you how it's done, and then you'll go, oh, this is, you know, this is exciting. This makes work play. You know, I often say, what if work was good for your mental health, not something you had to recover from afterwards? Yeah, nice. That's the future of work for me. So where, where do reward programs sit in all this? Because a lot of people, uh, myself included, as a business owner, I'll, I'll add reward programs that I think will improve the wellness and the well-being and the, and the way people feel at work. But you know, do they form part of the mental health strategy or would you see them as, as sitting outside of that? I think they form part of the action plan. 
So, okay. so your strategy is really the objectives of what you want to achieve as a business when it comes to this and what are the, the, the what's the impact you want to see. That's how I see it. And then within that, you've got your action plan. Now, it's, it's um, clear that it's not a one size fits all. You spoke about the, you know, we've got varied genders, we've got inclusion, we've got neurodiversity. So you can't just go to a business um, and say, well, we've got this app, we've got a meditation app. Yay, yeah, one yeah. and done. Or we've got this one reward system. I just see in my small team, some people, if you think of the gym, they want to track everything and it like motivates them and whatever. And for other people, it's like, that's a total turn off. I want to show up when it feels right, you know? So great, do some reward systems, but test if it's working for the people yeah. in your demographic in your company and um, make sure that there's, a, you know, a, an array of things that are out there for people, but then challenge people that their mental health is their responsibility because you need organizational and individual responsibility. I love this. I feel like I'm getting some free consulting here, Petra. I feel like you've got the foresight to answer the next question before it comes. <laughs> but what I was going to, literally, my next question is going to be, so here at JJ Recruitment, absolutely true. We have just embarked, I mean, literally this week, on a journey to develop our own well-being roadmap, right? So where we've made that starting point. We plan to include some well-being initiatives that hopefully keep people engaged throughout the year, not just as a one seminar and it's forgotten. So I'd love to know from your perspective, what are the, the proven initiatives that you've seen have been sort of really effective that perhaps us and others that are listening to this may want to consider in their own well-being roadmaps? So um, people often ask me, do we have to start from the top, top? Like, where do we start? Like, is it the exec team? Is it the management level? Is it all the people? Right. And again, like, let's not overcomplicate it. Right. In a perfect world. Yeah. Yes, you've got all your exec team completely bought in, leading by example and giving permission to others through their behaviors, not just what they say, to, to do things themselves, right? Um, but sometimes there's different ways. Now, I don't want to name and shame any particular ones, but I feel like there are some that are approaching this from mental health is about learning signs and symptoms of poor mental health and what to do in a crisis. And I personally think that is a less useful approach in the workplace. Not everywhere. Like if you think of the charity sector, if you think of the police, if you think of frontline places, absolutely, we need those sorts of trainings. And if you want to go in, in, in depth, um, but at the workplace is the last place where people will show their, their signs and symptoms of poor mental health. It just is. Right. And so that's where the masks show up the most. Yeah. So if you're just yeah. like um, training up all your people to be the little meerkats looking for signs and symptoms, right? If you think of some of the recent suicide stories, they were people that were described as the life and soul of the party, the person who had it all, right? Um, and was always smiling, or I went to them for support. Well, doesn't that challenge the notion that we should be training each other in signs and symptoms? What we should be yeah. training each other in is bravery, authenticity, and creating space for people to connect and belong. That's what we're looking for. And that's in micro ways, fun, team building, and it's in deeper ways. I've got, you know, P I struggle with PTSD. And if I'm having an off day, I will let my team know, you know, and they'll say, is there anything we can do to help? And I'll go, well, actually, I'm probably just going to go for a walk and I'm good. Whatever the conversation is, if somebody comes to me with their mental health issue, I don't immediately think, ooh, I wonder if they're good at their job. Maybe I should take yeah. something off their plate or send them home. Th these are the fears. This is what stops us having conversations, right? But again, you can see I could talk about this all day. Uh, the approach that we take, again, in our mental health champion training, our mental health for leaders course, is about creating those safe spaces for connection and belonging and learning to listen and not need to fix. It's really quite simple, but very hard to do, right? Create yeah. safe spaces and let go of the need to have the answers. And that actually creates the biggest impact. It's very, very powerful. Very powerful listening to you speak. I mean, I hope there are people listening out there where this is really landing for them like it is for me. Um, but we know that HR directors, HR professionals listening to this, there'll be many that are overworked, that are stressed, that have concerns. And you know what? They may not even be about the workplace. It could be about home and we don't know about them. We do, What we do know is every everyone I've ever met and most people ever meet will go through some kind of trauma in their lives, right? Whether it's losing a parent, uh, going through an accident, having an illness, whatever it might be, right? It's it's part of the human commitment we make is that at some point in our lives, we're going to go through some sort of trauma. And as you say, it's the hardest thing sometimes is sharing that and knowing about it and knowing what's happening in people's lives. If there's someone listening to this right now where your last 
comments in particular which really resonated with me and i'm sure they landed for others and it's suddenly it, it's 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 caught them off guard perhaps and they've gone you know what? i do need to talk about this there, there's something here that no one knows about they all think i'm this bubbly energetic lovely person at work that, that would never be stressed in their life you know but actually inside i feel very different and i need to take as time now you've inspired me to take the mask off what would, what would be the next course of action you'd recommend that individual took so that awareness is a beautiful first step, right? That was the, the, the point that began to change my whole life was going, oh, there's something going on. If I don't do something, something bad could happen, right? I got to take action. I want to, you know, I'd love to be like a coach that just says, well, start talking and take the mask off and talk yeah, to everyone. Sure. No, there are some cultures that are toxic and are culty and are um, unhealthy to be in. And your mental illness will be used against you. And that's kind of like, I hate saying that, but it's true, right? So I would just kind of assess who my allies are. 100% open up and talk to someone, even if it's a little bit, like it doesn't have to be all of it straight away. It's a little bit, but it could be a friend outside of work. It could be a therapist. You could call the helpline and have a, a chat about what's going on, whoever it might be. Like once you begin to verbalize it, you notice that the impact, as you said, earlier is connection because someone yeah. else goes me too right especially these days um if you do have some people that you know or they get you at work even if it's just through banter or tasks or whatever um begin that conversation and if you're not in hr you that you may not know what networks exist right sometimes people think going to hr is like <gasps> formalizing yeah. it and making it a thing right and so see if you've got a mental health champion network look at the resources you know um but I, I, I feel like every time I have been honest, um, my life has gotten better. Sometimes you feel the little, what we, what Brené Brown calls the vulnerability hangover. So yeah. like immediately after you're like, oh, what have I done? Right. Um, and then afterwards you're like, that person leans in and you're like, oh, I'm not alone. I am not the only one experiencing this. So certainly talk, but do, you know, um, assess a little bit. Does that make sense? Because it, the workplace should be the yeah. place. But it's, sometimes it's small steps to making it that way. What I will say is, in my experience in the, in the world of coaching, uh, for example, is talking at verbally, verbalizing something, as you, the word you used, is yeah. way different than, than the voice we have in our heads. And if we go if back, we right back it, to, right? To, yeah, to the Michael Neal thing of talking to a lamppost for half an hour, if we took, go back to that lamppost metaphor piece, actually, we think these things all day long, but saying it out loud sounds different. So even if it just means going out and speaking to a lamppost, you probably find that that's the start of some benefit in hearing that voice in a slightly different way. But um, I mean, like the, every, every piece of advice you've given is so powerful. I hope it's really, really landing. You mentioned a lot about um, well-being champions. Now, where do we go about finding our allies? Where do we go about finding our champions? How do we, how are champions made? And, and, and what can we do to implement, you know, initiatives that, that incorporate champions so people do feel but there's somewhere they can go. So I, I always think just get volunteers and people will, will arise. You know, if you say, Hey, we want to help ch change the culture. We want passionate people who get it. You will be, you'll think, Oh, I don't know if anyone will show up. I have never in my entire consultancy career found them to be lacking or to be like, Oh, nobody applied. People yeah. want to do this. They want to create change and, and um, create impact. Um, what happens often is, you get this group that's excited, you do a role description, you get some training in, you know, and the training again, is it signs and symptoms focused or is it about internal activism? I want that group to be your internal activists that are backing up that positive approach to well-being in the workplace. Now, what happens if they, uh, is, is the momentum. So you've done all this exciting work and then three months, six months later, I'm like, hey, do you, does anyone know who they are? Is what's morale like? Are they still meeting up, you know? And if in six months or a year even, it's just dipped and fallen off a cliff, HR might think, well, we tried and that was a bit pointless, wasn't it? Um, but there's some um, techniques and tactics to be aware of to help build that momentum. So one is if you have a strategy that enables a container for that group to help bring some things to life that will um, meet some of those strategic objectives. So it's not just like, oh, meet and talk about who came to you and what's tough. And, you know, it's like, model the behaviors, ask each other about your mental health. Because if you can't model it there, there's no way you're going to model it out there, right? right? So do that piece and then go, what are our strategic objectives when it comes to well-being uh, in our workplace? What can we do to bring those to life? And so 
what often happens is people meet and they just get a shitload of tasks. I didn't check if I could swear. Um, okay. And then nobody connects. And then they're like, oh, I'm volunteering my time. I'm maxed out and busy. I'm, I'm not going to show up anymore. Right. So volunteers get the training right, but then get the momentum right. So we do the training and then we do um, huddles, what we call them huddles. So like that ongoing support to yeah. reinvigorate, uh, refresh learning and enable them to take action. Because what happens is we hire and we, we um, get volunteers for internal activists and then we, we um, contain them and we say... I if anyone's watching this rather than listening to it and they've just seen me smile halfway through that answer, I swear there's a hidden camera in here because I wrote the, I've got one word written down on my page. Like you've got the foresight for my next question. And I just wrote momentum question mark. How do we go about building momentum? And you just answered it again. It's, it's strange. Every time I think of my next question to ask you, you kind of, we answered it one question earlier, which is fantastic. Um, but you're absolutely right. And actually right at the start of that, you said, you know, you may be wondering who would who would nominate themselves to, to be the champion in our business. So we've got 25 staff and we, as part of our roadmap, which we were, as we were embarking on at the minute, um, I did actually throw that question out. Who would like to be a mental health champion? And then a team of 25, six people have agreed to go on the mental health awareness uh, training level three to go and be mental health champions for our company. Six out of 25. That's a huge percentage. There you go. So they're definitely yeah. out there in every business. There are people that want to volunteer there. And that's, a, I think that's a great sign of, of, the mentality of the workforce as well. People do want to be supportive. People do want to do want to help. Taking it high level, um, yeah. we talked or you talked briefly about return on investment, right? We know that yeah. HR directors, they need to manage their agenda with ROI in mind to be able to report back to the board, to, to be able to manage the expectations of their stakeholders and the broader organization objectives. Yeah. So with that in mind, what are the things they should be measuring in terms of impact when it comes to HR strategy? What are the ROI objectives of an HR uh, mental health strategy or project or agenda? So first of all, depending on the size of your business, you may or may not have lots of data, right? So sure. it's, it's kind of seeing what you have. And part of your strategy might be to put some building blocks in place for additional, for gathering data and feedback, right? Um, people may have uh, an engagement survey, that's prob probably the one you hear the most, right? We've got a, a system or something that, that does pulse surveys or annual surveys. Uh, again, what, what are you doing with that? But it's things like attrition, absence, which you're measuring anyway, yeah. um, burnout, how many people, you know, sick leave, uh, medical costs, your EAP analytics, um, presenteeism is a, a bit of a complex one, but there are some algorithms that enable you to, again, put the story of that data together. Um, so that, that, that's kind of just high level. Some of the pieces that you may be gathering already. How many people are leaving your business? You know, how many people are you retaining? How many people are off sick, even if it's for physical illness? Because we know that people still mark themselves as physically unwell when, when something sure. else might be going on. So it's thinking about that range of uh, types of data and then pulling it together again, speaking to each other or getting people like us to help with, with kind of analyzing that piece. And then crucially, we could sit in the theory of it for forever because often you've got the people that are real, the human people, and then you got the data people, right? And then it's like, can they translate to each other and speak the same language or wear all those different hats if it's one, one sort of role? Um, but it's, it's effectively, you want to be able to lo lower costs in the business in the long term. If you think of the grand scheme of things, increase your, your, your profitability, um, harness performance and attract and retain talent. So those are some of the, yeah kind of buzzwords, the, the, the bottom line of the business that really matters to the top. And even in cost of living crisis, you know, budgets and trying to think what's working and what isn't, what's the usage and engagement on your fancy apps or your this, that or the other? Like, that's my first question. How sure. can you reposition budgets that you already have to really think about it from a prevention perspective and a performance perspective? I mean, I know firsthand, right? Recruitment can be expensive. So there's value in, in working on retention. This is the world of, of world that I specialize in. And, um, you know, it can be expensive to, to replace talent Absolutely. that leaves the door because they're not happy. But we also know a happy workforce is, is predominantly a productive workforce. So there's a lot of truth in that as well. You almost, almost kept on your, uh, your form of answering my next question, but not quite. So I'm going to ask this. The last question before we open the HR L&D vault, uh, Petra, is this. If I'm an HR professional, I'm overworked, it's really high on my agenda, I haven't got the time to implement this myself, but I want to come to a company like PVL to support me. Can you tell me a little bit more about the services that you that you provide at PVL and your team? But also, 
if there are any questions that perhaps I haven't asked, which PBL sure. could answer um, yeah, yeah, yeah. in that response, uh, please bring that, you know, bring it to light and see how if there's anything there. That I appreciate want that. To get I appreciate with. that. So, so the first thing is our well-being strategy program. So you're right. You guys are overwhelmed and often um, are, are doing so many things, but not necessarily getting the credit for the impact. It's still seen as like the fluffy HR stuff over yeah. there rather than like, hey, I can present to you at your uh, quarterly board meeting exactly the steps we've taken, where we're at, where we're going and show you a pie chart and whatever. So we've got the system and the people. So we've got an analyst and a, a head of strategy that support businesses to do that effectively. Super. And then what's beautiful is at the end of the year, getting that ROI number so that you can keep keep pushing forward. But then we do just a whole range of courses, webinars, lunch and learns, all with the aim of improving culture, belonging, connection, right? So we, we, we do tackle the tough topics. Like we've got panel events for suicide prevention uh, day, for, for menopause, for a, a variety, men's mental health, a variety of things, right? But even those tough topics, like you've seen in my story, it's, it's about connection and an uplift, what next? What are we doing with this information, right? We've got our Mental Health for Leaders course, Mental Health Champions, and our exec session to really help back you up in explaining this conversation right to the top as well. So yeah, reach out. We'd love to uh, help and, and, and talk to anyone who's interested. Fantastic. And of course, if you are interested, the website is available in the show notes. So do have a look at that and you can click straight through along with a LinkedIn profile and an Instagram profile for Petra as well. Amazing. Before we get there, though, let's open the HR L&D vault. Three short, sharp questions for you. Uh, first one is this. If you could give one piece of advice to the world, Petra, what would it be? Um, practice bravery every day. And I'll, I'll steal this one from Brené Brown. It's hard to hate people up close. And I think that um, highlights that in a culture uh, where there's so much polarization in, in politics in the world at the moment of us versus, versus them, like leaning in and getting to know the human behind the, the story or whatever yeah. it might be is essential. Fantastic. Uh, second question, if you had uh, the opportunity to give a younger you some advice who's just setting out in this new world of work, what would that advice be? This is always a tough one. Like I've got a book coming out in May and I never thought in a million years I could do something like that. You know, so many books influenced me, right? So sure. um, one step in front of the other, it's going to be okay and you're going to get there. Fantastic. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about the book? Is it ready? Do you have a title? Sure, it, yeah, it it's coming out day? in May. It's available for pre-order though. So we could send you that link as well. It's called Definitely Begin With do. You. More of my story, but also tactics and tips for managing your own mental health and that of your company. Fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to keep that in the show notes. We'll look out for that. And my last question, of course, is what is the guiding principle behavior you've seen in every great leader that you've worked with? I recently did a LinkedIn post on this, giving time and attention, even when you're stressed out and busy. And that just means slowing down when the whole world is speeding up. That's all you need to do to support people. And those are the most profound leaders I've seen. Nice. Fantastic. Well, listen, I have to remind all the listeners here as well. If you're listening and you're in a, in a, in a low place, Petra's story is a phenomenal one. Please do find out more. You can find out on the website. Uh, there will be a link in the show notes and you can find it at Petra, uh, velsboer.com. Um, the spelling uh, is P-E-T-R-A-V-E-L-Z-E-B-O-E-R.com. Com. So do have a look at the show notes. It's a fantastic story. And I want to say a huge thank you for me for empowering so many people to think positively at work, for helping so many people and for reframing um, your your own mind to, to from rock bottom to having such a positive impact on the world of work, Petra. I take my hat off to you. It's a phenomenal story and it's taken such courage. You, uh, I, yeah, I'm in absolute awe. So I'm Super, super <laughs> excited to have had you on the show today. Uh, of course, if you are an HR and uh, professional listening to this show and you need support with an HR vacancy, please do get in touch with either myself or any of my wonderful team here at JJ Recruitment. You can reach me at nick at jjrecruitment.com and our link will also be in the show notes. I'll also put a link to uh, Petra's LinkedIn profile for those interested in connecting. Um, and it just leaves me to say a huge thank you once again for joining me today on the HR and podcast. I look forward to bringing the next episode real soon. Petra, thank you. Thanks for having me. That's it for today's episode of the HR l and podcast. I hope you found this discussion informative and thought-provoking and that it gave you actionable insights to help you drive your HR agenda forward. 
please remember to subscribe to the show so you never miss a future episode. And I'd also love to hear from you. So if you enjoyed this show, please do leave a review on your preferred podcast platform. Your feedback helps me to ensure I can continue to bring you the topics and guests that matter most to you. Oh, and don't forget to share this show with your colleagues and fellow HR leaders as well. The more we spread the word, the more we can grow our community of HR professionals who I know are all as dedicated to driving the future of work forward as I am. Thanks, of course, for tuning in. My name is Nick Gay. Please do look me up on LinkedIn and send me a connection request. It would be great to get connected. In the meantime, I look forward to bringing you the next episode of the HR L&D podcast real soon.